afternoon and welcome to League of Women Voters of East Multnomah County. My name is Kathy Minden and I'm secretary of the East Multnomah County unit of League of Women Voters. And it's our pleasure to bring you today a speaker about the Voting Rights Act. And Becky Strauss is the legislative director of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. And she'll provide you with further information of her background. And we've invited her today to address the issue of the very recent US Supreme Court decision on discontinuing the civil rights law passed in the mid 1960s by then President Lyndon B. Johnson. Ms. Strauss will speak for approximately 30 minutes and we'll have 15 minutes or so remaining for questions. And we'd like to thank you for watching our program today and we look forward to hearing from her. Ms. Strauss. Thank you, Kathy. Um, it's great to be here and great to be invited. My name is Becky Strauss. Um, as Kathy mentioned, I'm the legislative director with the ACLU of Oregon. So I work with our um, state affiliate of the ACLU um, national office, and I focus mainly on state level advocacy. So I do a lot of lobbying down in Salem when the legislature is in session, and when they're not in session, I do a lot of work around preparing for ballot measure elections that may come up um, in a general or an off cycle election, and also some advocacy at the local level, um, do some lobbying at the city of Portland and uh, Multnomah County level. And to the extent that we can broaden our reach statewide, I try to do advocacy at, in other localities as well, Lane County specifically. We've had a strong presence in Eugene for a very long time. So I've come today to talk a little bit more about some of the things happening nationally. Um, but I think I'd like to, at the end, relate it to what folks in Oregon can do or what what we all um, might do at the local level to, to look at the issue of voting rights. So thank you for inviting me and I'll just go ahead. I have a few slides and um, I think this is a small enough group that if you'd like to ask a question, um, maybe in the middle, that's, that's fine um, or you're welcome to save it for the end and maybe we can have a nice little discussion if you'd like to do that at the end. Um, I just wanna mention a little bit other than um, advocating for voting rights. Of course, the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, um, it, we have our hands in all sorts of issues um, protecting civil liberties. And so this last term at the US Supreme Court, the ACLU National Office had a record six cases before the Supreme Court um, where we were direct representation in those cases. Uh, you may have seen the um, decision in um, Windsor v. United States ruling that the Defense of Marriage Act was ruled unconstitutional by the US Supreme Court. Um, and that was the case that, um, that overturned the law that said that um, same-sex marriage cannot, would not be recognized by the federal government. And our US Supreme Court said that um, the government, the federal government cannot discriminate against married, lesbian, and gay couples for the purposes of determining federal benefits and protection. So that was an ACLU case, and you'll see um, lots of others of ours in the news um, on a daily basis, really, and um, ramping up to the next session of the Supreme Court. And of course, among the cases that was an ACLU case was um, the Shelby County case that, that I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that case was, um, what happened, and, and what, what's happening since that decision is, is mostly what I'm gonna focus on today. So. You are all aware that the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. Um, there are three sections in particular about that law that became um, very important in the modern day discussion. And so I'm gonna talk about, just sort of run through three of those very important sections that sort of sets the stage for what the Supreme Court had to decide on its plate and what the Supreme Court did decide. Um, so first of all, we have section two of the Voting Rights Act, which as I've, I've quoted here, the, the law bans any standard practice or procedure that results in a denial or abridgment of the right of any citizen to vote on account of race or color. Um, and, and after the Supreme Court decision, this section is actually still intact. So this is kind of the bedrock of the Voting Rights Act right here. 
states, any government can't pass laws that um, will result in the denial or abridgment of, of the right to vote. And this is, as we all know, the right to vote is, is kind of the, the ultimate right that we have as Americans. I think that the right to vote touches more pieces of our constitution than any other right. The ability to exercise your right to vote is, is kind of how we exercise um, our, our views in a democracy. And it's, it's just um, immeasurably important. And so this section two of the Voting Rights Act is, is the bedrock of that protection of that right. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this issue, but I just want to mention as I'm talking about Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act is a pending case up in Yakima, Washington, our neighbors to the north. Um, this is another ACLU case where um, using this Section 2, the ACLU has said that the system in Yakima, Washington of the way they do their elections um, is at-large elections as opposed to district elections. And actually, Gresham has the same system. So I'll talk about that a little bit, too. Um, what, what the ACLU is arguing up in Yakima, Washington, is that system of at-large elections, meaning when they vote for their city councilors, um, they just vote for a slate of candidates. And it's kind of, you can be from anywhere in Yakima, Washington. As long as you get voted in, you're up there on council, as opposed to a district election where Yakima would be divided into, say, five different districts, and people who live in that district get to go represent their district up on the council. Um, what the ACLU is arguing in Yakima, Washington, is that at-large election system um, unlawfully dilutes the Latino vote in Yakima, Washington, and effectively prevents Latinos from meaningful participation in the elections. And, and as I says, I'll talk about this a little bit more because the situation is similar here in Gresham. Um, and I mention this because this, the, the, the case in Yakima, Washington, which is still pending, we don't have a decision on that, um, we're using section two. We're saying that this, this section of the Voting Rights Act um, results in a denial or abridgment of the right to vote. So that's a very important section and, and has become increasingly more important as after the Shelby County decision last term from the Supreme Court. Um, the next section is section four, and I'm gonna skip over it and then come back because it starts, it's a little easier to think about if we talk about section five of the Voting Rights Act first. Section five of the Voting Rights Act is what's called the pre-clearance requirement. Um, this is one of the key issues that was before the Supreme Court. And what Section 5 says is that in certain places in the United States, um, no change in voting procedures can take effect until approved by specified federal authorities. Um, and what they mean by federal authorities is usually the Attorney General, um, Eric Holder is the Attorney General now, or sometimes it's a three-judge panel will serve as those federal authorities. Um, and what this means is pre-clearance requirement, and this is, again, a key piece of the Voting Rights Act that was passed in 1965, said there are some jurisdictions in the United States that just have a history of discriminatory voting schemes. So much so, such a, um, dare I say, ugly history of voting laws that we, they need to go to the federal government for permission before they do anything new on voting rights. Um, and this, this kind of structure has been in place for a very long time, since 1965, and it's meant to um, act as a safeguard against discriminatory voting rights laws. Um, and, it, and it's particularly in this context, it's really important that this sort of thing is a pre-clearance, it's a pre-approval, as opposed to how we deal very often in our court system. A harm happens and then you go to court after the harm happens to tell the judge or to, to find your redress for the situation and you make good kind of um, retroactively. In elections, that doesn't really work because the election has happened. You can't redo a discriminatory election. The harm has happened and you kind of have to deal with it. And so that's part of the idea between, behind this section five is it's, it's preemptive. It's meant to provide a, a buffer and sort of pre present the challenge before the harm happens. Um, so this is a very important structure. It's, it's the pre-clearance requirement and this is part of what the Supreme Court was dealing with. The part. So this is section five. Again, the Supreme Court kept section five intact 
So we've talked about section two, about not um, abridging people's right to vote. That's intact. We've talked about section five. In covered jurisdictions, no change in voting procedures can take effect until approved by federal authorities, pre-clearance requirement. But what do we mean by covered jurisdictions? How do we, how do we decide what that is? Um, so that's going to take us back to section four now. Section four provides the formula to decide who is subject to preclearance, which states or which local governments have to go to the federal government first before um, enacting any new sort of voting rights law. So section four is kind of what, what helps us determine who's subject to preclearance, and it um, provides what's called the coverage formula. The coverage formula defines what the covered jurisdiction is, um, and it, the way it was initially defined and was kind of tweaked over the years, but is more or less keeps this basic principle that historically, um, if there was a state or a county or a local jurisdiction that maintained a test or a device as a prerequisite to voting, um, and then because of that had a low voter turnout historically, um, we're talking about early 60s and 70s, um, then they're, they're, they're covered under the coverage formula. They're subject to preclearance. So what do we mean by um, tests or devices? Some of the things historically that were what we think of as bad voter laws, um, literary and knowledge tests uh, back in kind of the um, early part of the century that would um, require a test before someone could either register to vote or could go to the polls good moral character tests, um, need for vouchers from registered voters. Um, and of course, a lot of these things at that time were proxy for um, racial requirements. It was meant to um, enfranchise white voters and disenfranchise non-white voters. Yeah, Kathy. Were those tests, everyone had to take them? It so they would be- Good moral character or literate? Everybody? That's right. That's right. Everyone would be subject to the tests, um, but the tests would be catered so that certain people would easily pass the tests and certain people would not. Um, certain things would be would be barriers, um, disproportionate barriers to most likely racial minorities at, at that time. So that's kind of the basis of the coverage formula in Section 4. In 1965, when the Voting Rights Act came about, uh, they said, you know what, if you are a state or if you're a county that's had these um, tests or devices in the past, and if in combination with those tests or devices, you've also had less than 50% voter registration or turnout in the 1964 election was the, was the first baseline year, um, you're subject to preclearance. You have to go to the federal government before you can change any new voting rights laws. Um, so originally in 1965, just to give you an idea of, of who, it, who in the United States we're talking about, the original states were Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, South Carolina, and Virginia. So we had six states. And then at that time, 39 counties in North Carolina and one county in Arizona at that initial phase kind of met that test to say, at some point historically, you had a, a test or a requirement for voting and you had 50% or less voter turnout. You you're fall under the coverage formula, you're subject to preclearance. Um, the Congress went back um, repeatedly after 1965, after the Voting Rights Act was passed, and, and made some tweaks and re-upped the act. So in 1968, um, new counties were added under the coverage formula to include California, some counties in California, counties in New Hampshire, counties in New York. Then again in 1975, came back, Alaska, Arizona, and Texas as full states came under what, what we call VRA states, their Voting Rights Act states. Um, they're subject to the coverage formula and subject to the preclearance requirement. Um, and also in 1975, additional counties were added uh, in California, Florida, Michigan, New York, North Carolina, and South Dakota. Um, so we're, what we're seeing since 1965 is that 
Um, there, there were actually some, at least one Supreme Court case that addressed the issue right away and said, yes, this preclearance requirement is constitutional. We're going to keep it going. Congress more than once came back and reauthorized the Voting Rights Act and said, yes, we, we on a bipartisan basis, we still demonstrate a need for this preclearance requirement protection. So again, we now know what under Section 5 covered jurisdictions are subject to the, the coverage formula. That's how we decide who is subject to preclearance under Section 5. So we fast forward to 2010, um, and of course this case is not the only case that involved the Voting Rights Act, but it's the most recent and it's the one that the Supreme Court just ruled on in the last, um, in the last session of the, the Supreme Court. Um, Shelby County is a county in Alabama, um, and Shelby County fell under the um, preclearance requirement. Subject to the coverage formula, Shelby County was a VRA county. Um, and, and Shelby County said that's not fair. And so they went to the court and said, we shouldn't have to kind of go for a mother may I to the federal government anytime we want to change our voting laws. It's burdensome. We don't think we need to. These are antiquated laws that are based on you know, decades old um, statistics. So they went to the court and they asked for what's called a declaratory judgment, really without any sort of fresh controversy. The, the county just went to the court and said, can you please rule this unconstitutional so we don't have to do it anymore? Um, and so they went, went to the court and they did that and um, that was at their very local level and the case went up and up and up. And um, at some point along the way, the ACLU teamed up with the Alabama State Conference of the NAACP. And, and we together, the, N, the ACLU represented um, the NAACP and several other um, African American residents of Shelby County and, and intervened into this case. So what started out as effectively the county asking the court for a ruling became a little bit bigger than that because now we had all these interested parties including the ACLU and the NAACP coming to, to sit at the table at the court and said, no, this is still very important. We don't want you to overturn the Voting Rights Act. Um, so we, we all came together. This is how it became um, what, what we think of at the ACLU as one of our cases, something that we're doing direct representation on. Our, our ACLU attorneys were working directly on, um, and we headed to the Supreme Court. So what happened when we got there? Um, we got a, a very, very disappointing opinion um, from our perspective. Um, and Justice, Chief Justice John Roberts is the um, justice who wrote the opinion. So I'll talk a little bit about what he said and how he got there in his decision. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about Justin, Justice Ginsburg's dissent. Um, the, the tally um, of the nine justices, the, the tally of the votes was five to four. Um, so it was a very close decision and um, a lot of dissent. So how did, how did Justice Roberts get there? Um, and, and by get there, I should say he struck down Section 4. Um, the Supreme Court struck down the coverage formula section. So as I said, we still have Section 2, very strong. We still have Section 5, which actually says you can, you can at some point some entity in the United States, some locality might be subject to preclearance, but um, the way you're doing this calculation is, is unconstitutional. And how did he get there? He starts out talking a little bit about federalism, and he says, the federal government does not have a general right to review and to veto state enactments to, before they go into effect. And despite the tradition of equal sovereignty, the act applies only to nine states and several additional counties. So he's highlighting two things. He's saying, generally, this is kind of flips federalism on its head. We don't usually ask localities to go to the government, federal government first and ask permission for what they might want to do. It kind of, um, that's really not how our country is set up. Um, so, so there would, well, I'll just leave that there. That's, that's not our default way of governing, he's saying. And the other thing that's concerning to him is, not only is that our, our, not our default way of governing, but in this case, we're only subjecting some states to it. 
or some localities to it. So if we're going to do it at all, it would seem like either all or nothing. So the kind of these two very concerning things about the very premise of what's happening here with the Voting Rights Act and the preclearance requirement. So he starts there and he said, but you know what, we, we have this Voting Rights Act, we've had it since 1965. In some cases, what he's highlighting is there may be extraordinary conditions where, although typically we wouldn't ask our localities to go ask the government, federal government for permission, sometimes we might. In 1966, he says, we found these departures from the basic features of our system of government justified. When we put the Voting Rights Act, we thought there's something unique about this. The blight of racial discrimination in voting had infected the electoral process in parts of our country for nearly a century. So at the time in 1965, um, there was something so extraordinary that it warranted departure from our typical views of what federalism and governing should be. Um, and, and he's quoting actually from a case called Katzenbach, which is um, a 1966 case um, by the US Supreme Court. So it was right after 1965, Voting Rights Act was passed, it was challenged up to the US Supreme Court in, in the Katzenbach case. Um, and at that time, they pulled up these, this extraordinary conditions situation and said, this is constitutional. We need this law. We need to flip federalism on its head because racial discrimination in voting is so dire in these places that, that we need extraordinary measures. So he's, he's, he's saying, okay, maybe sometimes we can get there. Um, but now we can't. You know, it's, it's 2013. Um, we've come a long way. Our extraordinary conditions that may have existed in 1965, 1966, whatever, they're no longer there. So he's saying, nearly 50 years later, things have changed dramatically. A statute's current burdens must be justified by current needs, and any disparate geographic coverage must be sufficiently related to the problem that it targets. The coverage formula met that test in 60, 1965, but no longer does so. Um, so, so where are we? He's talking about, he's, he's really kind of trying to, to nuance the, the rejection of the Voting Rights Act. He didn't strike down Section 5. He didn't say that in, in no case would we flip federalism on its head for an extraordinary condition. He's just saying that the way we did it in 1965 and, and the years after, it no longer fits the climate that we have now. Um, and I think from the ACLU's perspective, we would argue that, that it does. That we don't, we don't throw it all out just because um, you know, maybe we may have made some progress since 1965 on, on racial um, issues. I think that there's still very much a need for this preclearance requirement and for these specific states and counties to be subject to it. Um, but Justice Roberts didn't, didn't really go there. Um, and he said, you've, you've got to come up with something else, whether it's Congress or you've got to rely on Section 2. Something's got to happen, but this Section 4 is unconstitutional. Of course, not, not all the justices agreed with Justice Roberts. And um, Justice Ginsburg wrote a very entertaining dissent. If you have the opportunity to, to look it up, I'll just pull out a couple gems. She says, the court's opinion strikes at the heart of the nation's signal piece of civil rights legislation. Then she goes on to say, throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. And of course, as a Portlander, I, I particularly appreciated that analogy. Um, what she's saying is, you know, listen, majority court, you've got you to find some correlation here. You're recognizing that maybe the, ex the same extraordinary conditions that we had in 1965 aren't there anymore, but hey, maybe did it occur to you that it's because of this section four and section five, that preclearance requirement? Let's, let's think about that a little bit. Um, from the years of 1982 to 2006 alone, because of, so that's where we probably, a little over 20 years, maybe 25 years, um, more recently than not, the, the Federal Department of Justice rejected 700 different voting changes under the preclearance requirement. So 700 different times a state or a local government said, we wanna do this in terms of our voting laws. And because of the preclearance requirement, those localities had to go to the federal government 
700 times the federal government said, nope, those are discriminatory and you can't do it. Um, so that's, that kind of goes to Justice Ginsburg. Th that's our umbrella there. And our, our umbrella for the most recent 25 years was shielding us from 700 different discriminatory voting changes. Um, Justice Gim Ginsburg goes on to talk a little bit about, um, she kind of muses on how the climate's changed um, and, and sort of gives a bit of a cautionary tale that um, even getting, she, she defines what she calls second generation barriers to voting. Um, so as opposed to thinking about um, literacy tests that was initially one of the factors in the coverage formula in 1965, she talks about um, at-large voting, for example, the, um, the scheme in Yakima, Washington and here in Gresham where um, district electors are, are voted in kind of in a clump as opposed to representing their smaller communities. Um, she points to that as a second generation barrier to um, enfranchisement of all voters in the locality. And I didn't put this up here, but I do want to read kind of how she, how she talks about sec second generation barriers or how she identifies the problem. She says, in truth, the evolution of voting discrimination into more subtle second generation barriers is powerful evidence that a remedy as effective as preclearance rem remains vital to protect minority voting rights and prevent backsliding. So she's saying that even you know, while we may not have literacy tests anymore, um, it's important for, for the Department of Justice at the federal level to evaluate these changes because they're best equipped, unlike state legislatures who might be motivated by politics or, um, again, dare I say, racial animus, um, it's, it's better to go to the federal government because they're equipped to identify some of these second generation barriers um, that, that where on its face maybe the public would say, oh, literacy tests, no, we're way past that. The public and the legislatures aren't really as equipped to recognize what's happening in this implicit discrimination through new voting laws. So at large voting is one of her examples of a second generation barrier. Racial gerrymandering is another one, um, kind of drawing district lines with, with an intent to um, dilute the minority vote. Um, and, and similarly, discriminatory annexation, where, where a legislature would incorporate majority white areas into its city limits um, so as to create a larger voting block or um, create a situation where fewer people of color maybe rise to elected office or have the power of their vote um, be heard in their locality. So the Supreme Court ruled on that case um, last session and really within hours, um, it was like the floodgates are open. We no longer have the umbrella, it's raining hard. Um, and probably within somewhere, if not hours, then one or two days, at least five states, um, actually six states, went forward with um, discriminatory voter ID, new, new strict, very burdensome voting laws that up until then had been blocked. I mean, some of the states, um, I think North, South Carolina's voter ID law had been passed by its legislature, but because of preclearance, was, was held up. There was an injunction on it because they hadn't been pre-cleared because of the harm that voter ID laws can have. Um, and, and just so, does everyone know what I mean when I'm talking about a voter ID law? It would be, takes all sorts of forms, but typically it's some sort of new requirement to either demonstrate citizenship status or residency status um, and to show, usually specifies very specifically what types of ID are are accepted in order to um, meet those requirements. So sometimes it's, um, you know, a, a social security card or a driver's license or all these things that um, really aren't aren't meeting any sort of demonstrated problem of voter fraud. I mean, the the advocates for voter ID laws say, well, this is this is just meant to protect your right to vote, and it's meant to protect against voter fraud. Um, but really, there. Are, very few examples of voter fraud. Um, so it's, it's an overcorrection to a, a problem that really hasn't been demonstrated. I saw a map, and I'm not going to do it justice, but I saw a map recently that, that compared the instances of um, 
reported sightings of UFOs or you know alien encounters to instances of voter fraud um, in in the United States, and there were more reported instances of um, sightings of UFOs than when there were voter fraud. Um, so here here we are, kind of trying to overcorrect a problem that we haven't really recognized exists. But in the meantime, these voter ID laws are um, uh, very clearly have a disparate impact on communities of color, um, low income communities, uh, older populations who um, it's not as easy to obtain uh, up to date, exact, correct documentation that they might need to go to the polls when they really never have had to before and um, shouldn't need to, in our view. So after after the Shelby County case was decided and the preclearance requirement was shut down, as I said, um, Texas, South Carolina, Alabama, Virginia, and Mississippi had the floodgates open to move forward with their voter ID laws. And then um, the sixth one, Arkansas, was a non-VRA state. It, it is not subject to the preclearance requirement, but it went ahead and, and did a voter ID law as well, just to get in on the party. Um, so, so where... Where do we go from here? I mean, I think we would, we would argue that um, we have a lot of tools in our toolbox, and, and maybe while we've come a long way since 1965, um, we've, we have made some significant gains in voting rights, discrimination at the polls does persist today, um, and really can't be dismissed in the way that the Supreme Court did as a relic of the past. It's not, it's um, minority voters still very much face significant obstacles in registering to vote and casting ballots. Um, and we've also seen over the last few years in states across the country, VRA states and non-VRA states, efforts to suppress the vote continue. Um, and, and sometimes the tactics have changed. Uh, we'll see this, some of the second generation barriers or early voting laws that are um, taken away, same day voter registration, a lot of things, ha changes happening in Ohio, again, a non VRA state, but um, these, these new ways of um, effectively suppressing the vote um, are out there. And, and so what do we do now that we are left in this post Shelby County world? Um, at this point, because the Supreme Court has, has struck down the coverage formula piece, Section 5 that talks about preclearance is, is kind of for now waiting in the wings because they're if you don't have a way to figure out the coverage formula, you don't have a way to figure out who's subject to preclearance. And so we're in a weird limbo and um, voter ID laws, all sorts of other discriminatory voting laws are, are happening and there really isn't that um, barrier, the, the umbrella as Justice Ginsburg says, to, to keep it from happening. So the, the ACLU clearly is not the only entity working to address these, um, but because I'm with the ACLU, I'll highlight a little bit of what we're doing and what we see happening in the, in the landscape around us to address that. So this is a um, picture of Viviette Applewhite. She's from um, Pennsylvania, and Viviette Applewhite is a client of the ACLU. Um, Pennsylvania is a non-VRA state, and so one of our tactics here, we kind of we have, we have the courts and we have Congress, more or less. You know, we have litigation and we have advocacy, mm -hmm. and under the umbrella of litigation, we have litigation in the non-VRA states, um, states that were never subject to preclearance. So we were kind of address unique tools there, and then we have the states that used to be subject to preclearance that aren't anymore. So we have one, just to highlight, one of our um, cases that's pending in Pennsylvania is um, Viviette Applewhite's case. Um, she's 92 years old. Um, she's voted in every election uh, for the past 60 years, but she can't get a government ID. She's tried. She can't. I think it's probably an issue of coming up with the right paperwork to get her ID. Um, and sometimes it's a, there's a cost barrier for people to get an ID um, and to keep renewing the ID. And, and sometimes it's a transportation issue to be able to get where you need to go to um, cross your T's and dot your I's. And um, Viviette Applewhite has not been able to do that. And so for the first time in 60 years, um, she would not be able to vote in Pennsylvania under Pennsylvania's voter ID laws. Um, most recently, so this is a case that the ACLU is working on in August, six, uh, mid-August of this year, uh, a judge in Pennsylvania issued a preliminary injunction 
blocking the law from being enforced in the November 2013 election. So the case is still pending, but this is a this is a win for us so far in Pennsylvania. We've we've gone to the court um, on behalf of Viviette and, and all sorts of other people in Pennsylvania that would be similarly situated because of Pennsylvania's voter ID laws and said, this is too burdensome. This is a violation of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and, and where we're bringing this case is under back to that section two of the Voting Rights Act. So we're, we're as a non-VRA state, we're not talking about pre-clearance. Pennsylvania what, didn't have to go to the federal government before they passed their voter ID law. Um, but in the ACLU's view and many others, um, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act still applies. What we've said is that this voter ID law will have a disparate impact. It will, it will repress the vote um, for many people in Pennsylvania, and therefore it's um, unlawful, and they should shut it down. So that's what the court has done so far. And we continue to work on that case and hope that um, the preliminary injunction, what the judge has said is we're going to put this on hold you can't do this yet. We're not ready for the November 2013 election for you to have this voter ID law in, in place. And, and what we hope and the ACLU hopes um, going forward and many other people in Pennsylvania is that that will become permanent and that the law will just be stricken from the books. Excuse me, which court? The which state court? State court or Supreme Court? This is, these are lower courts, so it, yeah, and, I, and I'm trying to, I believe this would be probably federal district court in Pennsylvania. Um, so we're not, we're not back up to the Supreme Court yet. So this is a, so again, Pennsylvania, they're a non-VRA state. They, they were never subject to preclearance. They're probably not going to be subject to preclearance now, but there are still other tools and they're still enacting um, repressive voter ID laws. Uh, and, and we're working to fight it. In contrast, we have in North Carolina, um, and I apologize, the, the photo's a little grainy, but I'll tell you a little bit about what's going on there. Um, North Carolina was a VRA state. They were subject to preclearance before the Supreme Court decision. So it's, it's a slightly different atmosphere, but um, I think right now, legally, it's kind of the same because they're both Section 2 cases. We're, we're using Section 2, what's left of the Voting Rights Act, to say, these types of voter ID laws are repressing the vote here in your state. Um, and I thought you all might, might like this case in particular because this is a great partnership between the ACLU National, the ACLU of North Carolina, um, and the League of Women Voters of North Carolina are all teaming up to challenge North Carolina's law. Um, what their suit actually is doing, they're specifically targeting provisions of their voter law that um, it, the law does a few things. It would eliminate a week of early voting. Um, it ends same-day registration for voting. It prohibits out-of-precinct voting. So we're not, not exactly, I think there is a voter ID element in there, but our lawsuit is focusing on those other things, what I would call some second-generation barriers to voting. Um, again, early voting hours, um, same-day registration, and prohibiting out-of-precinct voting is what this law does. Um, and I should mention, obviously, here in Oregon, we're in a little different boat here um, with vote by mail. But I think we all understand the importance of early voting to enfranchising voters in other parts of the country. Um, so, so what this ACLU and League of Women Voters lawsuit in North Carolina is doing is seeking to stop North Carolina from implementing this new law, um, arguing that it, it would burden the right to vote and discriminate particularly against African American voters. In, in violation both of the US Constitution and of the Voting Rights Act, Section 2, that we've talked about. Um, so here we have, this is a, a press conference, and again, sorry, it's hard to hear, but I think this is, this is the legal director of the ACLU of North Carolina at a press conference announcing their lawsuit. And you see um, folks in the background, both from ACLU and the League of Women Voters, are standing in solidarity together. Um, so again, we have, we have litigation in all of these states. Um, some of them are states that were subject to preclearance. Some of them aren't. Uh, but but the, the work in the courts certainly does not stop. Um, even so much so that Eric Holder, the attorney general at the federal level, is, is getting in on the action as well. So we have the ACLU filing lawsuits, several other groups filing lawsuits and trying to monitor, kind of salvage what's left of the Voting Rights Act and use that. Um, and, and so is Eric Holder. He is, he's going in with the Department of Justice and, and 
filing lawsuits in both Texas and North Carolina. As you'll remember, those are both VRA states, so states that were subject to preclearance and no longer have been, and, and those are two states that kind of right away stormed forward with new, very restrictive. North Carolina's voting, um, voting law is, I think, probably like the most restrictive voting law ever, um, at least since um, pre-Voting Rights Act. So that's litigation. Um, of course, there is advocacy and lobbying and things that um, our lawmakers can do with what's left of the Voting Rights Act. And so one high priority of the ACLU and other groups is to urge Congress to go back and create a new coverage formula, um, which is pretty much what Justice John Roberts said um, in his opinion. He said, "We're again, Section 5 is still there. We're not taking away the idea that you can ever have a preclearance requirement. We're just saying that Section 4, the way we calculate this, is old. And Congress needs to go back and revisit it. And so um, that's kind of where we are focusing our efforts. Um, Congress can write a new formula to protect our right to vote. Um, and it's really not just wishful thinking. We have um, Congress has been supporting um, the Voting Rights Act really since its enactment with bipartisan votes to renew it and support it and adjust it as we move along. And so it's not unrealistic to think that Congress will not go back. Um, of course, right now with our this slide up here, we're in a um, particularly precarious situation with this Congress. Um, there's a lot going on, as you may, as you all know. Um, and so we hope that that we hope that the government gets back to doing its work. Um, but we also hope that that work and those fights don't distract from some of the other also very real work that Congress has on its plate, um, including creating a new coverage formula. And so just wanted to mention up on the upper right-hand corner is a woman named Laura Murphy. She's with um, the ACLU, and she's our chief effectively lobbyist. She's with our Washington Legislative Office, and she runs all of our advocacy efforts in Congress. Uh, so, so she's leading a team, talking to Congress people, and, and really working to put, put Section 4 back in place so we can get a strong preclearance requirement back in some of these states that are, that are enacting very repressive voter laws. Um, and then there's things that we can do at the state level specifically in Oregon. And so I'll sort of wrap up here talking about some of those efforts. Um, Oregon is actually um, in a unique position because we're seeing across the country some of these very repressive laws, but um, we don't have that same climate politically. Oregonians don't really stand for it. And so we're in, we're in a place where we can really work to do some affirmative things to enfranchise voters rather than repress the vote, as we see in other places. So. Um, the Affordable Care Act is, is taking effect right now. Um, this is a huge opportunity actually for voter enfranchisement uh, because you have people looking, going to the health insurance exchanges. A lot of that's online, but sometimes they're doing it through a service provider. Um, and that's an opportunity to register voters. So we are working, the ACLU is working with several other partners to urge both the Secretary of State's office and Cover Oregon, our um, insurance exchange here in Oregon, to put in place through the registration process for health coverage, health insurance coverage, a place where you can either register to vote for the first time or update your registration and just have that kind of be a clearinghouse. And that's, that's really important. We anticipate that that will bring in hundreds of thousands of voters to Oregon, um, to Oregon's rolls. Then up in the upper right-hand corner, a photo of someone doing voter registration. You may have all followed in the last legislative session, um, Secretary Kate Brown had an initiative that did not pass, um, but I think she will continue to work on it, which would be a, a scheme of automatic voter registration ha happening through the DMV. So that if you go to the DMV and you're updating your license or you're doing whatever kind of interaction you need to do there, um, the DMV would automatically send your information to the Secretary of State's office and register you to vote. Um, to be honest, the ACLU, we, as, as a multi-issue advocacy organization, we often find ourselves um, trying to wrestle with different civil liberties interests, and this certainly came in place there. 
Um, I'd be curious what you all think about this idea of presumptively sending from the DM, you know, you go to the DMV for a license and all of a sudden, even sometimes without knowing, your information is over to the Secretary of State and you're on the voter rolls. Um, the way that her bill was set up, um, and I think she'll come back with a similar concept in the future, would be that the voter would have a 14-day window to opt out of that. So you would get, you would go to the DMV, you would have that experience, your information would get sent to the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State would send you a little postcard in the mail that said, you're, you're getting signed up, you have 14 days to tell us you don't want to register to vote. Please send this back and, and opt out. Um, we always prefer, in terms of information sharing, to have the user, the driver, the voter, whatever it is, opt in to that experience so that you're, you're fully informed of what you're doing, where your information is going, you're choosing to register to vote. Because, frankly, some people don't want to be registered to vote, and that's fine. Um, so, but it, I think that the idea is thinking creatively, and I certainly think that Secretary Brown is doing that. And sure, her heart is in the right place. She's, she's trying to enfranchise Oregonians um, to vote. Um, she doesn't think that voter registration should be a barrier to civic engagement. Um, so I think we'll see that coming back. But, but the idea that here we are in Oregon with some um, really great opportunities to think creatively about how we might um, enfranchise voters. So look out for that. And then finally, I'll just kind of sum up with the, the piece about Gresham. I've alluded to it a couple times. Um, I'm not sure if any of you were part of that work that happened in the November 2012 session, or I'm sorry, um, election. There are a group of folks um, working in Gresham. I was trying to think if they have a kind of organization name. And if they do, I can't think of what it is. But um, working to change Gresham, Gresham City Councilor elections from a scheme of at-large voting to district elections, um, particularly in the Rockwood neighborhood, from what I understand of the population of Gresham. Um, more heavy representation of Latinos in the Rockwood neighborhood, really, than anywhere else in Gresham. And so what happens now is I believe there are five city councilors in Gresham, and it's at-large voting. So many of them come from the same, um, I think, relatively affluent area of Gresham, as opposed to having representatives from different neighborhoods in Gresham come together so that um, it might increase the chance of Latino voter participation in Gresham elections, possibly have um, more people of color uh, as city councilors in Gresham. And the ACLU, we, we support that effort. We, we endorse their work to, um, or you know, kind of publicly supported what they were doing to try to shift the scheme from at-large elections to district elections. And that was on the ballot um, in November 2012. It did not pass. It was a local um, local effort. And my understanding is that the group is looking to try to try to do that again and continue that work. So if that's at all of interest, um, I, th I think it's, it's important to think about how those types of schemes really fit into this larger discussion about voter enfranchisement and um, kind of what can we do at the local level now that we have this um, gutted federal law that's been a protection for, for so many nationwide for so long. How can we serve as a model for, for forward thinking on these issues? So um, I'll leave you with that thought and think a little bit about um, what, what that means and would love to chat a little bit. We have a, um, a little under 10 minutes, so could stop there. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Well, I appreciate your explanations. I, I don't agree with them. <laughs> yeah, so let's, let's chat. <laughs> because I think that it's a person's responsibility to register to vote. Mm -hmm. And the idea of just automatically putting people in and an opt out, I think is terrible. It's like the subscriptions that to the various things, and it comes unless you opt out, and I think that's wrong. I, I really, yeah, and just to, you can continue, but I want to respond, um, and just for the sake of the um, microphone, I'm not sure if that, just kind of raising the issue of this opt-in, opt-out issue of voter registration, and um, to be honest, our instinct at the ACLU was much like yours as we, as we heard that um, proposal at first. We've really wrestled with it, and 
Um, we don't. We haven't really come to a conclusion. I don't think we have a, an official position on the bill right now. Um, it's a big effort um, politically from the Democrats, um, and it's a just kind of and it's a big effort on an opposition route from the Republicans. And I think it's worth mentioning that. Um, in Oregon, at least, increased voter enfranchisement, increased registration um, is more likely to bring more Democrats onto the rolls um, than Republicans. And so I think politically it's become an issue in terms of who supports it and who doesn't. The ACLU is nonpartisan. We don't participate in those sort of electoral conversations. Um, but we still do f are really wrestling with what that means to have um, your information shared, why should your experience at the DMV tie you to something that you um, is wholly unrelated without your knowledge and um, without your consent until later? I, um, we're, we're wrestling with that, I would agree. Yeah. And the other thing is about our, our voting and regression. Uh, the information is that Latinos are not represented. Well, they are. We do have a counselor who is Latino from the Rockwood area, and she's very vocal. And they've tried to get uh, candidates from that area and have been unsuccessful. So to make it mandatory, I, I don't like that. Yeah, well, I appreciate you raising some of the other, other sides of the debate. I mean, they're very important. And, and when we think about um, sometimes what, what some of these laws mean, in theory for us legally, we like the idea of district elections because in theory it's, it's bringing representation closer to who it is. Um, but in Gresham, you know, I don't, I don't know if at-large elections, what that's meant for policy. Has, have the district um, or have the city councilors only focused on issues from, from where they live, even though they're representing everyone? I would guess, you know, probably not. That's not what they're elected to do. Um, and it's, and none of these are, are black and white by any means. So I, I really appreciate thinking about all those sides. There, there's a lot to consider. And then we only have a two, three minutes yeah, to cover right. such yeah. complex issues <laughs> nationally as well as statewide and, and locally right. too. Um, excellent presentation. And I, I don't know, um, I would love to have further questions because there's, there's so much more to discussion here about protecting voter rights because that is what the historical background of mm -hmm. women voters Absolutely. is all about yeah. and registering people to vote. And it's time to really think creatively. And, and there are other ways possibly that would not step on people's individual rights mm -hmm. that could be worked out. So there, there's still so much for discussion. So I would just like to conclude with thanking Becky for Thank covering you. the Thank subject you. for yeah. us today and invite our viewers to uh, like us on Facebook because we want to have this information shared with as many people as possible. And our website is also mentioned, I believe, on the, um, at the end of the broadcast. So thank you for joining us today and we look forward to having another presentation to that impacts our local communities as well. So thank you for joining us.